Hello. Hello, NPs. This is APR in Central. This is uh, Dr. Jennifer Klamek Gingling. Tonight, we're going to do an orthopedic review, uh, a lecture called Can You Kick It? Um, I hope you enjoy it. If you do, and you like what we do here at APR in Central, we're really trying to help students and our colleagues who are in practice strengthen their skills and their knowledge. Um, please like us on Facebook. We also have the APR in Central study group. Please feel free to share that with your friends and colleagues or on Instagram and Twitter. We also have a website at www.aprncentral. So let's jump into it. Can you kick it? So one of the first things I'd like to um, talk to you all a little bit about is um, osteoporosis. And um, when you look at this slide, You'll see the slide on the left, and those are nice, healthy, really bright white bones. When you look at the, the picture on the right, you'll see that they're almost see-through, and this is um, indicative of osteoporosis. And you can see with this um, individual, there also is a uh, fracture of the hip. We know that osteoporosis is deterioration of the bone tissue, and it's caused by hormonal changes um, in calcium and or vitamin D deficiency. Um, often in, in the, in, and we see it a lot with women, we'll see kyphosis, which is a vertebral fracture that's due to osteoporosis. Um, we use the FRAX, uh, Fracture Risk Assessment Tool, and um, women less than 65, um, we often can see an increased 10-year fracture risk. What are some of the risk factors? Um, individuals who are um, of Asian descent, Caucasian, chronic alcohol use, age. Um, pre if you have a patient who has a previous history of a low trauma fracture, especially in somebody 50 years of age, that's a big red flag. You want to make sure that you're um, assessing this patient for osteoporosis. We also know with estrogen and testosterone deficiency, this can is a risk factor as well. And um, so you need to think about your patients who are in early menopause, especially uh, less than 45 years of age. Now you think about your patients who have had a complete hysterectomy, um, maybe our breast cancer survivors. You think about osteoporosis, another risk factor is somebody who has a BMI less than 20. These are our patients, especially who are anorexic or bulimic. Um, someone who has a family history, once again, that history is so important when you're assessing your patients. Someone who has a sedentary lifestyle, um, our obese patients, and uh, patients who smoke and or use a lot of caffeine. Now, secondary osteoporosis, that can come from medications. And um, you can see that in, in an individual who's been on a glucocorticoid um, more than 2.5 milligrams for more than three months. Uh, individuals on anticonvulsants, they're phenobarb, phenotoin, um, individuals who have been on chemotherapy, uh, cyclosporin, our Depo-Provera patients, um, individuals with thyroid supplements, PPIs, you know, keep that in mind, someone who's on chronic um, uh, PPIs, uh, you do need to make sure that you are assessing their um, osteoporosis risk. Um, you know, your tamoxifen, your methotrexate, those are also um, some of the drugs that possibly could um, increase the osteoporosis uh, risk and give your patient a secondary osteoporosis. We also know with nutritional disorders, our alcoholics, um, we talked about the anorexic and bulimics, uh, individuals who have malnutrition, someone who has a, a vitamin A um, excess, and our vitamin D deficiency. So we know that's something we want to potentially check in our patients. Um, renal insufficiency, lupus, and our RI patients too. So when it comes to osteoporosis, we do use a bone density scan or the DEXA scan. And um, you want to do a DEXA scan T-score every year, two years beginning at age 65. So if you see, when you, you get your results, if you, you should see if your meds, um, if you your patient on meds, and um, the T-score will be more positive. So normal is greater than negative 1.0. Osteopenia is negative 1.0 to negative 
osteoporosis, on the other hand, is um, e equal to or greater than negative 2.5. Okay, and I, I like the graphic on the right because it kind of gives you a, a um, way to kind of you know look at the barometer of osteoporosis. Um, and, you know, we, we definitely want to be screening women over the age of 65. That is um, right in our guidelines from the National Osteoporosis Foundation and the USPSTF. So how do we treat osteoporosis in individuals 51 to 70? We want to make sure, and if you're going to be testing soon, this is really important for you to, to take note of it. The dose for vitamin D is 600 to 800 international units per day for vitamin D, okay? For calcium, the dose is 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams per day. Um, uh, Fosamax is our first line um, drug for osteoporosis. You wanna make sure one of the anticipatory guidance um, that you wanna give your patients is um, that you wanna make sure that they sit up straight and they take the water, um, take their medication with water because you wanna make sure you avoid esophagitis. Um, you know, the PPIs, it's, it's a big consideration that's a, um, you know, adverse condition, you know, um, they can cause the osteoporosis for long-term use. Um, when you think about drugs that may help your patients who have osteoporosis, we know that a thiazide diuretic that will increase calcium absorption and decrease bone demineralization. You want to ask your patients and encourage, um, you know, you want to ask about smoking always every visit, but you want to, um, you know, try to encourage smoking cessation decrease alcohol and caffeine intake, and, you know, some of the anticipatory guidance that you may talk to your patient about your diets is an increase in the dark green vegetables, salmon, sardines, soy, and citrus. You also want to encourage your patients um, to participate in weight-bearing exercises, walking, jogging, biking, you know, aerobic exercises. Okay. So osteoarthritis, we know that there are more than 20 million individuals affected in the U.S. Um, with osteoarthritis, um, you're going to see destruction of the cartilage, thinning of the cartilage. Um, you know, often, you know, when you're looking at your patients, you may see your Herbidin nodes, your Borchardt's nodes. Often osteoarthritis will start in one joint. Okay. These patients may have some morning stiffness, but generally it's less than 30 minutes. Um, this is a, osteoarthritis only affects the joints and it's, it's due to wear and tear. The um, cartilage is affected. You may have asymmetric um, ball, uh, bone and, and joint involvement. Um, you're gonna see this a lot in the big joints, your knee, your hip. Um, you're not gonna often see red, warm, swollen, tender joints with osteoarthritis. Um, it's not very common. Pain is a slow onset and it gets worse as the day goes on. These patients should have normal labs. Um, you know, you do want to encourage them to, do, like, uh, like with osteoporosis, to do aerobic exercise, some walking. And how do we treat them? We're going to start with Tylenol first and said second. You may use capacitin cream. You may use some glucosamine, um, the, the um, purple supplement, the SAMI. You want to encourage weight loss uh, against smoking cessation, they, and you may even um, have your patients do acupuncture or Tai Chi. Okay, this is a picture of the uh, arthritic knee x-ray, and I, what I want you to look at is it, the x-ray on the left. You can see that there's a nice joint space. It looks nice and crisp. It, um, you don't, it doesn't look ragged at all, and there's a lot of space in between the femur and the tibia, especially the tibia plateau you're looking at. Now, when you look at the picture on the right, you can't say the same. You've got a rough joint say a surface. You also appears that there is some joint narrowing. And you can see that there's, it's labeled clearly, there's some osteophyte, which are some little um, like hooks you may see in that joint surface. All right, so rheumatoid arthritis. With RA, 
You can see in this picture, um, you've got the ulnar deviation of the fingers. Um, about 2 million people in the United States have this as well. You're going to see your rheumatoid nodules uh, in these patients. You may also see swan neck deformities, um, and this is due to the extens extensor tendon subluxation. They also may have a boutonniere defect, which is a hyperflex uh, DIP joint. This, um, with rheumatoid, it starts in many joints, not just one joint like osteoarthritis. And you want to make sure if you're, if you're testing that you are very clear, make a, a grid out osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid because they're very different in the presentation um, and, and sometimes are complete opposite. So starts in many joints. You're going to have morning stiffness, more than 30 minutes. Okay, this is thought to be autoimmune. It's, uh, it's systemic. It's not just the joints that are infected. These patients can have uveitis, scleritis, vasculitis. They can have pericarditis. Um, the synovium is affected. Okay, we know with the osteoarthritis that the cartilage is affected. So it's two different parts of the, the bones that um, are affected. You're going to often see, instead of the big joints that we see in osteoarthritis, this uh, RA often will affect the small joints of the hands and the feet. These individuals may present with red, warm, swollen, tender joints, and there generally is an acute onset of the pain. These individuals, if you, you draw some labs, we know we're gonna you know, check a rheumatoid factor, a CRP, um, and the, the SED ray, they, they may all be elevated. These individuals, you know, we know with osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, um, well, the osteo, process, we want to do weight-bearing exercises. With rheumatoid arthritis, you want to do non-weight-bearing exercises. This would be swimming, this type of thing. First line uh, treatment is your uh, NSAIDs, okay? Then you're going to move to your DMARDs. DMARD, one the common one that we use is methyltrexate. You may uh, think about biologics, the Humira and Nebro, or you may use the um, NITNF as well. And this is a picture so you can visualize what a swan neck deformity looks like in, in your um, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. And there's a picture on the right. On the left, there is a, a boutonniere defect. Okay. You can see the hyperflexion of the DIP joint. All right. So when you think about your herbidins and Bouchard nose nodules, these are some of the things. This is one of those um, exam questions that is a great of pets. If they often um, will show up, they may give you a picture and ask you to be able to differentiate between the two. So one of the ways that you can remember um, Bouchard's versus the herbidins, when you look at um, Bouchard's, we know that's the PIP joint. The herbidins is the, the um, DIP joint. And um, remember that B comes before H in the alphabet, so the, the B is closer to the hand. It may be one way you can remember. Um, you know, uh, another way that is kind of a silly way, but is to think about um, my friend Snoop Dogg. Okay, Snoop Dogg uh, holds his joint in the DIP joint. Okay, and that is the Herbert and Jones. Okay. So if you think about how he's holding his uh, cigarette here, you can see that he's holding it in the DIP joint. And you think about the herb, the herb, the herbidin nodes. Okay, so for shizzle, you should get this one right on the exam. All right, let's talk a little bit about psoriatic arthritis. Um, a lot of times in these patients, it, it, they will have arthritis that's um, Asymmetric. Um, it's usually found in the DIPs. They, uh, these patients can have tenosynovitis. Um, they are going to present with painful swelling of the fingers and the toes. Um, they often will, um, they, you'll see it called sausage fingers or dactylitis. You're going to see pitting of the nails. That's why the, the picture on the right is there. You can see the pitting in the nails um, with these patients. And they're going to have um, a co-diagnosis of psoriasis. So these are the patients. Think of psoriasis, silvery scales. We know if you take one of the scales off, if they have pinpoint bleeding, that's auspice sign. 
um, these patients often will have seronegative um, labs, okay? They're not going to have an elevated ESR. They're not going to have an elevated CRP. Um, psoriatic arthritis is an erosive disease. Um, basically, the joints erode and, and basically dissolve. And I'm going to show you a picture in a minute so you can see. When you look at the x-ray, um, they often will describe it as a, a pencil in a cup. You're going to treat these patients with uh, your NSAIDs, glucocorticoids, um, methyltrexate, your NITNF. Um, again, you want to encourage smoking cessation, weight loss, exercise, and they may need uh, referral to PTOT. So here's another picture so you can kind of see um, what I mean when I talk about the um, sausage digits with the erosion of the joints and um, the dactylitis. Okay. All right, to really hit this home, um, here's a slide that describes and has side-by-side -side psoriatic arthritis versus rheumatoid. So on the, the left, you'll see the psoriatic arthritis um, versus uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, and they, they'll talk about um, rheumatoid arthritis having rat bite um, erosion. And if you look at, on the bottom picture, number C, it looks like somebody took a chunk a bite out of an Oreo cookie right there, and that's it. It's what they mean by the rat bite um, erosions. Um, with psoriatic arthritis, you can see the bone erosion, um, and this is the, what I like about this slide is it's the same patient and the progression of the disease. So you can see, you know, early on in disease to the left, more severe diseases to the right. So that last picture on the top, you can see how it does look like a pencil going right into a cup, the, the way that the bone has eroded. Okay, so just to kind of give you a visual, psoriatic arthritis versus rheumatoid. All right, gout. So you've probably seen gout in your clinical practice. Um, if patients can come in, they're pretty uncomfortable. Um, and when you look at the little man here, you can see that the areas that are most common is that at the base of the great toe, it's the most common area, but they can have it in the midfoot, the ankle, the knees and elbows. Less common, but can happen The patients can have the gout in their shoulders, wrists, and fingers. Um, these patients are gonna come in, they're gonna present with um, warm, painful joints. Um, they may have subcutaneous tophi, and those are like little nodules on, on their hands and elbows. Um, gout is uh, caused by crystal deposits in the joint. Often the patient will have a um, elevated uric acid, and this is caused uh, a lot of times by uh, dietary purines. So um, alcohol, beer, um, you know, rich foods, they, they sometimes will cause the rich man's disorder. Um, you know, if a patient is having an acute attack, they may not have a, an elevated uh, uric acid level because all those crystals are right in that joint. Um, they may have a history of kidney stones. Okay. Um, you know, often you, the patient will come in when they're in an acute attack. Um, you're going to use your in, uh, NSAIDs. First line is your indomethacin. And um, then uh, your second line would be your colchicine. Okay. They're going to, you're going to try to give that as close as you can to the, the first uh, sign of an attack. And then you want to stop if the patient has uh, nausea stomach upset or diarrhea. Corticosteroids is your thir third nine uh, dose or third nine uh, drug. And if the patient is on allopurinol um, and, and they present with an acute attack, you want them to continue on with the allopurinol. You're not going to start that um, abruptly. And, um, you know, patients are on the allopurinol uh, or the probenicide uh, for prevention. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about NSAIDs. All right. NSAIDs um, are the leading cause of drug-related mor morbidity. Um, patients who take NSAIDs are at risk for GI complications, um, especially if they have um, are over the age of 60, they have a history of coronary artery disease, renal disease. Um, if they have renal disease, you want to avoid NSAIDs, obviously, because it is broken down in the kidneys. Um, patients with gastric ulcers, uh, history of dyspepsia, um, 
uh, peptic ulcer disease, somebody who's on uh, oral coagulants, you also want to avoid smokers and, and, and people who use have chronic alcohol use. You want to use uh, caution with your NSAIDs if your patient has hypertension or CHF. Why? NSAIDs um, promote sodium retention. We know with sodium retention, that means there's um, increased fluid volume in the body. That's going to increase their blood pressure. If they already have a problem with fluid and they have CHF, obviously you don't want to increase that problem. Um, and since our, our contraindicated preoperatively, pre okay, so if you're seeing your patient for a preoperative visit, you want to make sure that you tell them no um, ibuprofen. Um, you want to use the lowest effective dose, okay? And um, in 2017, they are recommending long-term PPIs if you're giving um, your patient NSAIDs. So just keep that in mind because you want to um, protect that mucosa of the stomach. All right, polymyalgia rheumatica. You're going to see this more in females than males. Um, average age is around 50 when you'll start seeing this um, happen. It's associated with giant cell arteritis and temporal arteritis. Um, this can be abrupt or it can be insidious. Um, Again, you know, gradually calm. These patients are going to present with um, morning stiffness of the neck. The, the shoulder and the hip girdle. This is usually um, symmetrical. Symptoms are more common in the morning, and they have um, something that they call the gel phenomena, and that's when um, the patients become very, very stiff after prolonged inactivity. Um, they may present with some constitutional symptoms like fatigue, malaise, depression, um, weight loss. They may have low-grade fever and they may have arthralgias um, or arthritis that's non-inflammatory. With these patients, one of the things that you'll note is that they don't have any weakness um, or muscle atrophy. Okay, that's a, one of those key things that kind of pulls the polymyalgia rheumatica out from some of the other um, disorders. Often they're going to have an ESR that's greater than 40, and the CRP is usually elevated in more than 6. Um, their CPK is usually normal. Our, our rheumatoid factor is generally negative, um, but in about five to ten percent of patients over the age of sixty, they will um, have a positive uh, rheumatoid factor without um, disease. How do we treat them? We know we want to treat with um, steroids. We're going to start with um, fifteen to twenty milligrams of prednisone daily initially. These patients will report a dramatic response. They will feel so much better, and that's really how you confirm um, the, the disorder. Um, you want to begin a slow taper after um, four to six weeks. Now, you want to treat for more than one year um, because we know if we treat for more than one year, they're going to have only about a 30% recurrence versus if we stop the um, prednisone in less than a year, there's about a 70% recurrence. Um, often you'll see too, if there's a failed attempt, two attempts with prednisone, these patients will be treated with um, methotrexate. Now you can't talk about polymyalgia rheumatica without talking about giant cell arteritis. Okay, we know that they kind of go hand in hand. These patients, they're gonna complain of persistent head pain and tenderness, usually in the temporal area. You're going to see those uh, temporal areas um, are tender. They look and feel cord-like, just like this picture. Um, they may have jaw pain or claudication when they're chewing. These patients, are, you know, with the systemic um, type of complaints, they're going to hit the myalgia, the fever, and fatigue. You want to make sure you do a visual acuity on these patients, okay? They can have um, decreased visual acuity. They may have a visual field disturbance or double vision. Um, they may present with a sudden permanent uh, loss of vision in one eye, and that's uh, due to a central right, retinal artery occlusion or ischemia. Um, and we know that about half the people with GCA also have polymyalgia rheumatica. So if this is what presents first. We know that we need to work them up for polymyalgia rheumatica. How do we treat these patients? Uh, patient shows up at the clinic with these symptoms. This is an ophthalmologist. 
surgical uh, emergency. They can lose their vision permanently. Um, you want to draw an ESR if this is suspected. These patients are often started on high dose steroids immediately to prevent a stroke or a second eye involvement. And um, to diagnose this, they'll need a temporal artery biopsy within a week of starting the steroids. All right, Paget's. Um, Paget's uh, is, is the second most common type of bone disease after we think about osteoporosis. Um, this is a, a bone disorder of remodeling, and I like this picture because you can see, especially in the right um, side of the picture, as you're looking at all that bone remodeling, you can see those bright white lesions, okay? Um, what happens is the body absorbs old bone and absorbs new bone in incorrect locations, basically. These patients will present with joint pain in the pelvis, the spine, maybe the skull, femur, and tibia. These individuals have an increased risk of fractures. Uh, fractures. Um, you're going to see with these patients, they're going to have, if you draw labs, they're going to have an increased uh, uh, elk files today. Um, you're gonna if they have a bone scan, you're gonna see um, abnormalities in bone remodeling. And um, first line treatment for these patients is the bisphosphonates, your calcium and vitamin D. The treatment is the same as osteoporosis when it comes to the calcium and um, vitamin D. Again, it's six to eight hundred um, international units daily of the vitamin D and 1,000 to 1,200 um, milligrams of calcium daily, okay? Um, when you think about the vitamin D, if the individual is over the age of 70, you want to make sure that you're giving them a higher dose at 800 international units of the vitamin D daily. And then also the um, bisphosphonate, um, your Fosmax, um, you, if you get your ordering that, you want to give that anticipatory guidance again, sit up straight, Take it with water, otherwise your patient will end up with esophagitis and really not be too happy with you. Okay, fibromyalgia. Um, what we know about fibromyalgia, it's idiopathic. Um, your patient, um, to be diagnosed, has to have had the symptoms for at least three months. Um, they're going to be, uh, you know, reporting fatigue. They may report that then when they wake up that they don't feel like they've had a good night's sleep, they're not refreshed. Um, they may complain of some cognitive symptoms. And these individuals are gonna have widespread pain. And in this picture, you can see the different areas, the, the, the pain points. And um, they're gonna have tenderness when pressure is applied to at least 11 out of the, body out of the 18 body points. Um, you need to make sure that you rule out um, other causes, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing a rheumatoid factor and ESR. You may do an HLA um, dash B two B twenty seven. How do we treat these patients? Um, NSAIDs, SRI, SSRIs, and sometimes the cognitive based therapy. All right, lower back pain. You're going to definitely see lower back pain in your practices. You may be seeing it in clinical already. It's one of the most common causes for patients to present to the clinic, um, and one of the most common uh, complaints. One of the things I, I want to point out with this picture is when you're laying down, these are pounds um, of pressure on the spine. So when you're laying down, there's like 25 um, pounds of pressure on the, the spine. I want you to look when you stand, it's 100. But if somebody's sitting, you think if you're sitting, you almost that you would think that maybe it would be a little bit better on the spine. But as you can see, it's about 40 pounds more of pressure on the back. So what does that tell you? Okay. Um, you know, you may be thinking about a herniated disc. Okay. When you have more pressure on the spine, you've got more pressure on these uh, herniated discs, so you may have more pain. So just I want to take a, pick a look at the picture because this is something that um, may come up too in your near future. If somebody comes in with lower back pain, you, you've got to think about some differential diagnosis, fracture, infection, tumor, osteoporosis. Do they have inflammatory arthritis or stenosis? We do know that for um, if you suspect a herniated disc, that the MRI is the best exam. Um, if your patient reports direct trauma to the spine, 
that's when you would want to get an x-ray to rule out a fracture. So if they have direct trauma to the spine, an x-ray is okay. But if you're worried about your, your discs, the MRI is really the gold standard. Um, how do we treat patients with lower back pain once we've ruled some things out? NSAIDs, um, we may use muscle relaxants, um, warm compresses. You may encourage these patients to increase their core strength, so abdominal strengthening muscles. Um, you know, you may encourage them when they're laying, you know, down resting, they want to lay on their back with a pillow underneath their knees to further alleviate any pressure that would be on the spine. Um, and when you have back pain, I want to kind of delve into some of the differential diagnoses that you may think about. So if you have somebody with back pain and um, you are, you know, some of the things that may be red flags for cancer is somebody who is more than 50 years of age with a new onset of back pain, someone with unexplained uh, weight loss. And these patients, when you examine them, may have some point tenderness. Cautica equina, okay? Any patient that comes in and you're evaluating for back pain, one of the things you need to ask them, have you become incontinent of your bowel, your bladder? Um, because with Cautica equina, we know that these patients can lose the um, anal sphincter tone and become incontinent. It's a big red flag. We know that these patients, that that's a, they need emergency surgery to decompress. They may, um, with Cotica Aquina, talk about saddle anesthesia. So they have, um, you know, numbness to the perineum, um, buttock area. Um, they may have motor weakness or a sensory deficit as well. Um, these patients, not only can they have urine um, incontinence, but they may have urinary retention as well. So, and often it'll be a progressive motor sensory loss. So, any of these red flags, you want to definitely send them to the ER. They need an emergent uh, surgery. So, if are you suspect of a fracture? So, somebody who has a fractured spine is often going to have significant trauma. It may be somebody who has prolonged use of steroids, someone who's over the age of 70 um, and maybe has a history of osteoporosis. We know we can have compression fractures. These patients, too, will have um, spinal point tenderness. Okay. Are we worried about infection? What is that patient going to look like? This patient may come in with fever, retrieval tenderness, and they may even um, have a, an active UTI. Um, one of the history that, you know, if somebody comes in with back pain, you want to ask, have they had any spinal surgery? Because if somebody's had spinal surgery within the past 10 months, or 12 months, excuse me, um, you do need to be vigilant and, and concerned about a spinal infection. One of the things that um, you, you really, you know, need to be having in your differential um, is an abdominal aortic aneurysm, too. These patients may come in with um, abdominal pain. Um, it, this, the reporting is ripping or tearing. Um, these individuals will have uh, coronary artery disease risk factors and or a past medical history of coronary artery disease. In an exam, you may see that they have a pulsatile abdominal mass, okay? So you want to do make sure when you're assessing your patients that you also do an abdominal assessment in your patients um, if they're coming in presenting and complaining about back pain. Talk a little bit about um, compression fracture. Okay, these patients um, often will have a history of osteoporosis and they'll report to you that they're having pain that's worse when they change position um, from supine to sitting or from uh, sitting to standing. Often they'll have a spinal uh, point tenderness as well. So, just some things to think about um, with back pain and you know, the patient, how they're going to present some of the risk factors. So some of the things that may be able to give you a clue on what's going on with the back is when you're doing the exam and your history, you, you're going to ask or, or perform some things. So a patient who you're suspect of cervical radiculopathy, you're going to have them lift their arm up or they may tell you, you know, I, I, I feel like if I put my arm over and behind my head, I don't, it, it, um, my symptoms get better, okay, my pain's better. So this may uh, give you a clue that this is cervical radiculopathy. Um, herniated disc, okay. We know that um, from the picture I showed you before, the pressure on the back is less when the patient is um, standing or when they're resting supine. 
but it's more uh, often with a herniated disc, it's worse when they're active, if they cough or sneeze and they're driving, or sitting or uh, bending forward. We know um, the MRI is a gold standard for um, evaluating uh, herniated discs of the back. Um, lumbar radiculopathy, or a nerve root compression of L4 to S3, okay? Um, keep in mind, sciatic is a symptom of radiculopathy, okay? Um, this is caused often by herniated discs or arthritis. Um, patients will tell you that they have pain that's in their low back and it runs down the back of their leg. Um, keep in mind, one of the things I do often is I will have a, um, a picture of the dermatones. And um, because if you look at your dermatones, you'll see like L1, L2, you know, because sometimes your patients will present with pain in different areas that um, will make sense if they, that where the herniated disc is. So that's a little trip. It's one of the things that I keep um, on my desk and easily accessible when I'm working. Um, with lumbar radiculopathy, these patients will tell you that the pain's better when lying on the non-affected side. And um, when you are doing your exam, you're going to ask them to do straight leg raises, okay? And if they have lumbar radiculopathy, the pain is going to be worse at 30 to 40 degrees. Okay. Lumbar stenosis. These patients, they're going to report to you that the pain is worse when ambulating or standing, and it's better when laying down or sitting. They're often talk about um, leg pain, uh, paresthesias, or weakness as well. So that's a, a, a couple of different uh, hints that may help you when you're getting together your diagnosis for your back pain. All right, sacrolitis. So sacrolitis is the inflammation of the sacroiliac joint. And you can see in the picture I've got the uh, arrows pointing to the, the SI joints, and you can see that there is um, some inflammation there. Um, these patients may present with, um, you know, they, they may have a low-grade fever. They may um, have decreased range of motion. Um, you know, this patient has um, sacrolitis and ankylosing spondylitis. Um, these arrows uh, that are on the slide point to the inflamed and narrowed SI joints, and they are white because they're sclerotic um, around those joints. Sacrolitis. And with sacrolitis, in order to diagnose it, you're going to have your patient lie on their side, and you're going to apply pressure onto their hips and they're going to have increased uh, lower back pain when you do that. All right. This is alkalinity spondylitis. Um, you're going to see this and it and when I, I kind of think about uh, when I look at this slide, the crooked little man and the crooked little house. Um, you're going to see uh, alkalosing uh, spondylitis more with men than females often will have the onset in their 20s. And if you look at the slide, this is the progression over you know, more than 20 years and how the patient will have some definite deformities of the spine with time. Basically what happens um, with these patients, it's um, inflammatory arthritis affecting the axial spine and sacroiliac joint. Ligaments, sacrolitis. Um, what happens is the bones or the joints and ligaments that are normally permit the the back to to have range of motion become very inflamed, and that causes new bone formation and fusion. And these patients, when you look at their X-rays, often they'll they'll call it a bamboo spine. And I've got a picture for you to look at in a minute about that. It'll kind of knock that point home. These patients are going to complain with pain and stiffness to the low back, about 60% of them. Um, it improves with exercise, not rest. Um, they will rarely have any motor or sensory nerve impairment. When you look at these patients, um, they're often going to have no kyphosis. Um, when you look at the slide in front of you, you can see that they have the forward hunched posture. Um, you can see with that fella, he's, um, especially at the end, he's lost the lumbar lordosis. They're going to have decreased spinal um, range of motion. 
because of the deformity of the spine, um, and you look at the fella and, and all the way to the right, you can imagine that he has decreased respiratory excursion. And these patients also may present with uveitis. Um, with the with the labs, they're going to look like they, their sed rate and CPRP will be slightly elevated. They these are patients that you would want to um, run an HL V27, and this is uh, generally positive in 95 percent of your patients with alkalosing spinalitis. Um, you may get a uh, uh, lumbar spine X-ray, um, and that would uh, show that bamboo spine. How do we treat these patients? We want to make sure that we keep them exercising, stretching. They're going to do PT, OT, NSAIDs. They may do steroid injections. They may do postural training. And these patients um, will be referred to rheumatology and ophthalmology. And here's a picture of the uh, bamboo spine. And you can see that they've had some bone remodeling right to the spine. And they're kind of connects one another. So that's why they have such a... a hard time with their spinal range of motion. All right, scoliosis. So scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine. It often is accompanied with spinal rotation. It is painless, um, usually asymptomatic when the, the patients are young. Um, rapid uh, worsening of the curvature is usually indicates a secondary cause. And with these patients, um, you're going to do the Adams forward bend test, okay? And this is where the patient bends forward with their feet together and knees straight while dangling the arms. So any imbalances in the rib cage or other deformities along the back can be a sign of scoliosis. The Adams uh, forward bend test is best for thoracic scoliosis, okay? Um, if you are suspect of scoliosis in your patient, these patients will need a full spine x-ray to measure the degree of the curve. And what we know is if the curve is less than 20%, we're going to observe and monitor. Um, we're going to refer when they reach 20 degrees, okay? Refer when we reach 20 degrees. More than 20 degrees, often these patients will um, have bracing. We'll use the Milwaukee brace. Greater than 40 degrees, Often, um, these patients will have surgical correction or a Harrington rod. Right, this may seem simple, but you may see this. You're going to see it a lot in practice. What do you do for your sprains or your contusions? Okay, you want to think rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. I know it seems simple, but sometimes uh, you may have your memory jogged and you once you're in practice, you're definitely going to see this often. Okay, growth plate fractures. Okay, these are called Salter Harris fractures. Okay, you would think the Salter sounds like the last name of the doctor that invented this, right? But I want you to look at this slide and you're going to see the very first bone on your left is your growth plate. Okay, a Salter Harris um, 1, type 1. Is a fracture straight across. Okay. Salter Harris type 2 is above, fracture that's above the growth plate. Salter Harris type 3 is a uh, fracture below the growth plate. A type 4 is through everything, there's your TE. And a type uh, 5 is a crush injury where everything's the, the growth plate may not even look like it exists because the bone is totally crushed. So Salter, straight across, above, lower, through everything, and crush. Easy way for you to remember your types of Salter-Harris fractures. All right, a bicep tendon rupture. Okay, you're gonna see um, this more with males than females, um, ages 50 to 60. Um, they're going to come in uh, and they may tell you they can't lift. They may tell you that their symptoms are worse when the arm is supine. They may uh, tell you while they were lifting at the gym or lifting a, a large heavy box that they felt a pop at the elbow. And basically that pop is the, the tendon coming off from the bone. Um, the weakness may also be worse if the, um, 
in supination versus flexion. And in this um, picture, you can see that they'll, they'll have a bulge in the arm. For these patients, you're going to do a hook test, okay? You're going to ask your patient to actively flex the elbow to 90 degrees to fully supinate the forearm. The examiner then is going to use their index finger to hook the lateral edge of the tendon by a uh, bicep tendon. Um, with an intact or partially torn tendon, the finger can be inserted about one centimeter beneath the tendon. An abnormal hook test, which has a distal avulsion, there'll be no cord-like structure to palpate or hook. Okay. So for a, a bicep tendon rupture, we're going to use a hook test to confirm their diagnosis. All right. Rotator or cuff injuries, tendonitis. Okay, what causes that? Um, rotator cuff tendonitis is often caused by repeated overhead movements. Uh, often will occur in the dominant arm. The patients will tell you that the pain is worse at night and may interfere with their sleep. Uh, they will report worsening pain followed by gradual weakness and ability to move the arm, especially if they want to move the arm out to the side, if they want to abduct. Um, they will tell you that they can use their arm for most activities, but they may tell you that they cannot um, use the arm for activities that entail lifting the arm as high or higher than the shoulder to the front or the side. And you may see this is more common in uh, people with occupation or sports or, or, or athletes that do excessive overhead activity, painters, baseball pitchers, um, people that work in warehouses who are stacking boxes. How are we going to treat? We're going to use that rice mnemonic again. Rest, ice, compress, elevate, and sets. And we're going to send these patients to GT. Um, if we're worried about a tear, we know that the MRI is the gold standard for rotator cuffs. Right. When you do your shoulder exam, there's some things that you want to do. And there's... Um, I like this slide because it really talks about you know, the adduction, the adduction, um, flexion extension, uh, because the, the shoulder can go in so many different directions. It, it can be a little confusing. So when you're doing your exam, um, one of the tests you may do is the aptly scratch test. So that you're going to have this test or test your patient's range of motion. So you're going to ask the patient to reach above their head and touch the opposite scapula. Um, this touch, uh, this, uh, test abduction and external rotation. Then you're going to ask your patients to reach behind their back and touch the opposite lower scapula. And this tests your abduction and internal rotation. Okay, so you're giving an itch on their back both ways. Um, if you're worried about um, shoulder impingement, you're going to ask your patient to raise their arm to shoulder height. And you're going to look at the space between the acronym, acronym and the rotator cuff, um, it should, this is, when you do this, it, it narrows. Um, and what's going to happen with these patients, they're going to report to you that the acromion, it impinges on the tendons in the bursa, so they're going to have increased pain and irritation. So the job or the empty can test, okay, you're going to have your patient um, have their arms, uh, they're going to, um, their arms are going to be rotated to full internal rotation or thumbs down. Once rotated, like they're turning, you know, dumping a can out. Um, once rotated, the clinician will push down at either wrist or the elbow, and the patient is instructed to resist the downward pressure. Positive test is if the patient has um, pain or weakness. Okay. Um, a drop arm test. Okay. So you're going to passively abduct the patient's shoulder. And when observed, then you're going to observe as the patient slowly lowers the arm to the waist. Often with a rotator cuff um, tear, the arm will drop to the side as if the patient, um, you, know, um, you know, they just can't hold it up. They have no strength. They may be able to lower the arm 90 degrees, um, but if it just feels like it, it's, it goes down to the waist, um, they can't continue the, the maneuver as far as the waist, okay? So there's some of the things you can do if you're going to be testing your shoulders. Empty can, okay? Athlete scratch test. All right. 
so rotator cuff in, uh, tears, okay? You may, your patient may come in and, um, I've had patients like I think when this happened, um, athletes, they're running so fast and they try to stop themselves on a wall, okay? Somebody who's falling and, and puts their arms out, um, you know, against resistance to cushion for a fall, somebody that's doing some heavy lifting, um, you know, often these, if it's a rotator cuff tear, there's a significant amount of force if the person is, is less than uh, 30 years of age, okay? These patients will tell you they have a sudden tearing sensation, sensation followed by severe pain shooting through the arm. They're going to be um, often, you know, tell you that they, they have limited range of motion or may complain of muscle spasm. The acute pain is generally from the um, is from bleeding into the joint space, and the you know that pain and the muscle spasm often will go away after a few days, but and they may have point tenderness or crepitus over the site of the rupture. With large tears, um, we talked about some of the things they aren't going to be able to raise their arm to the side. They they can do it with some help, and. For a rotator cuff injury, we're going to use the empty can test and the drop test. What are we going to do for these patients? We're going to rest, ice, elevate. We're going to immobilize with a sling. Okay, we don't use the shoulder immobilizers anymore. And these patients are going to need an MRI to rule out uh, an official chair. All right, elbow injuries. There were a couple really cute, um, like little mnemonics. So remember, because I get these confused all the time, and um, one of the ways to remember, if it's a medial epicondylitis, meet me for golf, okay? Meet me, medial epicondylitis, okay? So golfer's elbow. Late for tennis, lateral epicondylitis, okay? Late lateral. So the lateral epicondylitis it's tennis elbow. This is for from overuse. It's not always with people who play tennis. It could be people who are doing repetitive mo movements in the, for their um, job. You often we'll see this in uh, individuals ages 30 to 50. The pain is out to the outside of the elbow. They're going to also have a weak grip. How do we treat? We're going to rest and says PT and a splint. Medial epicondylitis is your golfer's elbow. This is caused by overuse again, ages 45 to 65, a little bit older. And this is pained in the inner aspect of the elbow. These patients also will, may report and may have a weak grip. Again, rest, um, ice, elevate, and NSAIDs, PT, and the splint. Olecranon bursitis, okay. Olecranon bursitis is caused by excessive leaning on the joint or trauma to the tip of the elbow if somebody falls. Um, this is, you often uh, in the office won't drain it. If that happens, it'll be in the orthopedic office. Um, but you treat with elbow pads, splints, and NSAIDs conservatively initially. Okay, Generally, you won't drain this. It just has to go and kind of dissipate over time. For those of you who are um, family nurse practitioners and take care of kids, common elbow injury in pediatrics is a nursemaid's elbow. Um, this is one of the most common injuries in kids ages one to four. Um, this is caused by the subluxation of the annual ligament due to a sudden longitudinal traction placed on the hand. Um, children ages one to four, often they, they are maybe running away from their mother or father or caregiver or mother, sibling. Or, um, you know, they're playing in the playground and their, their older uh, child is swinging the littler one by the arms. Um, my daughter decided she wanted to do a backward dive off her um, changing table when she was about a year and a half or two years old um, while I was changing her. And I grabbed her arms to stop her from going off the table. And um, she had a nursemaid's elbow. How are these patients going to present? Um, they're going to refuse to use the arm. Um, they'll hold the elbow in slight flex, uh, flexion with the arm or forearm pronated. And they, they'll, they'll almost like in, instinctively splint their arm. They may hold it against their body. They may have lateral tenderness, uh, tenderness to the elbow. 
Um, they'll have full flexion and extension, but they will have pain with supination. Okay, how do we treat them? First thing we're going to do for these kids is we're going to try to reduce it. If we reduce it, the kid starts moving the arm quickly, game over. Um, if you have difficulty reducing it or um, you feel like it's been reduced and the child is still really guarding that arm, you may want to do an x-ray because you may have, have had a dislocation with a fracture. Okay, how do we reduce them? You're going to hold that arm supinated at the elbow. And then you maximally flex um, the elbow with the, and the, help, you know, the provider is going to apply pressure over the radial head. If it goes back into place, that radial head, you're going to feel a click or you're going to feel um, that reduce, uh, the radial head reduce. Okay. Carpal tunnel. All right. Carpal tunnel is a, a really common disorder. You can see this often. So it's caused by repetitive movement. Um, used to see it a lot with secretaries, and now everybody's using keyboards so much. So I have a feeling that we're going to see more and more of this. And basically, this is the compression of the medial nerve that causes pain or numbness. Um, you may see it often will present, too, in women who are pregnant because they have some swelling um, to their feet, their hands sometimes, and um, they'll have a, the compression of that medial nerve. How do we um, test for it? We're going to do the Tonell sign, and you're going to tap or do direct percussion over the wrist to reproduce the pain, and the patient will report tingling um, increases. Phelan's test is when you flex both of the wrists with the dorsal surface of each hand pressed together to reproduce the symptoms. Okay. It's kind of like backwards praying. Put it up, your brain down. And they're going to, when they get into this position, they're going to tell you that they have increased um, paresthesia and whatnot. How are we going to treat these patients? NSAIDs, um, cock up splints, and sometimes they will do uh, surgery to decompress that nerve. And they can actually do the surgery um, with local anesthesia if they have to, with your pregnant patients, if it's uh, causing that much disability for them. Another disorder you could see um, in the wrist is a ganglion uh, cyst. These are common. They're round, fluid-filled, um, you know, mass on the dorsal wrist. Um, usually these are painless. See them in ages 15 to 40, men more than women. Often these will clear on their own. Um, you know, sometimes you may use a splint. Um, the orthopedist uh, may... You aspirate, they may do surgery. Um, when you hear the term Bible banging, um, I think about ganglion cysts because this is a, like an old wives' tale. They'll take a big, huge book, think about your primary care book, and they'll bang the cyst hoping to make it go away. So you don't want to do any Bible banging with your ganglion cysts. Okay, a scaphoid or navicular fracture. In this x-ray, you can see that a uh, navicular bone should look like a cute little kidney, kidney bean, okay? You shouldn't see a fracture through it, okay? Um, often you're going to see a navicular fracture, and why, why it's important for you to pay attention to it is this is going to be a patient who, again, fell on outstretched hands to maybe stop a fall, Um you know, you, as you're worried about the wrist, you want to make sure that you also assess that scaphoid. And they call it the anatomical snuff box. So if they um, extend their, if they have their hands, um, you know, flat and extend their thumb upward, you're going to see right at the base of the thumb an area that looks like a little groove. And this is where they used to do snuff years ago when that was a popular drug of choice, like in, uh, turn of the century. So anyways, that snuff box is the anatomical snuff box. You want to make sure you give that a good push. Do they have tenderness there? Because if they do, you need to get an x-ray of the hand as well as their, their wrist. Um, so the scaphoid fracture is called a snuff box fracture. Um, it may not show up right away. Okay. So if the pain, patient has pain there, you need to follow them up 
with a repeat x-ray in one to two weeks because that fracture may not show up right away. Why is that a big deal? Um, if there's a scaphoid fracture that is not um, detected, um, they are at high risk for avascular necrosis or a non-union. Anything with the hands, you know, there's high liability, they could have decreased range of motion of the thumb and the, 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 the hand. So they want to, you want to refer these patients to a um, hand surgeon. Before you send them to the hand surgeon, how are you going to prepare them to go? You're going to use a thumb spike a splint. So scaphoid navicular fracture, they're going to have snuff box tenderness, okay? You're going to, the x-ray may not show the fracture right away. You're going to have a repeat x-ray in one to two weeks, and you're going to put them in a thumb spike a splint and refer them to the hand surgeon. So moving on to a collis fracture. Um, once again, this is um, an individual who has um, trying to cushion themselves from a fall. Um, this is uh, the most common type of risk fracture. Um, sometimes you'll hear it called a uh, dinner fork fracture. And this is uh, a, a collis fracture is a fracture of the distal radius of the forearm. You can see the x-rays uh, in these pictures. The arrows are pointing to that fracture. All right, the Quervin's tenosynovitis. All right, this is swelling and pain at the base of the thumb and wrist pain. It's caused by overuse. Um, patients with rheumatoid arthritis may present with this. Um, you know, that your patients that are pregnant um, may have this as well. How are we going to assess it? We're going to do the Finkelstein test, okay? So you're going to have your patient bend their thumb across the palm of their hand and, and bend their fingers around that thumb. And then you're going to ask the patient to bend the wrist towards the little finger, okay? You may ask them to do it. You may do passive on their deviation. That's that motion. You can see, the, see how the thumb is straight and then it, it is um, bent towards the little finger, okay? If it is positive, they're going to have pain on the thumb side of the wrist that um, indicates to Quervon's tenosynovitis. Um, how do we treat this? We're going to um, use NSAIDs, and we're also going to use a thumb splint as well for these patients as well. All right, this is a picture of active Renaud's. Okay, with Renaud's, you're going to see demarcated pale or cyanotic skin starts in one or, or several digits as response to cold or stress. I live in the Northeast, so we see a lot of Renaud's because we have cold um, weather here. What, do, what is common with Renaud's that it will spread symmetrically and it will end with a rapid reflow of blood to the fingers. About 10 to 15, no, 5 to 10% of um, the U.S. population has Renaud's, so it's a pretty common thing. Who's more apt to get Renaud's? Women, ages 15 to 20. Um, with Renaud's, these patients always will have these symptoms before the age of 40. Okay, if it's not, it's, it may be something else. Um, and and um, it also can run in families. A, a lot of times when you do your family history with these patients, they'll have a first degree relative that um, has Renaud's. And like we said, it was, um, like I said, it was it's also more common in a colder climate. Um, sometimes your patients may take pictures with their hands because it, it can come just go away just as quick as it comes. And in the picture A, this is a shows the sharply demarcated pallor resulting from the closure of the di digital arteries. And then in B, um, you can see the digital cyanosis of the fingers. So this can be all different colors, okay? What do we do for the patients? We want to um, encourage them to quit smoking. We know that nicotine causes the, our skin temperature to drop, so that can uh, cause an attack. We want them to control stress. Um, we know that uh, emotional um, upsets can trigger an attack. 
You want these patients to keep warm, um, avoid cold temperatures. You know, when they are in cold temperatures, they want you want them to wear um, gloves, you know, something on their head, layers. Um, and keep in mind, air conditioning, you know, this time of year in the summer, I know sometimes you go into buildings and it's so cold, it feels like it's that you're in uh, Alaska. We treat with calcium channel blockers. Those are drugs that end with peen, nifedipine, amylodipine, philodipine, um, and, they, and sometimes they may use uh, ginkgo biloba. It makes sense because we use that for, um, it's a natural herb to use for, that some of our patients will use for stress. And um, you want to make sure that you are um, taking a good look and um, do they have any ischemic ulcers? You know, these patients are patients that may end up on aspirin. Um, so you want to just make sure that there aren't any open areas on those fingers. All right, pelvic and hip fractures. When you look at this patient on the side in front of you, if you look to the left, um, you can see that there's a fracture there, okay? Um, both are caused by trauma. Um, the patients may have pain, ecchymosis, and swelling to the lower abdomen, hips, groin, or scrotum. These patients may or may not have bladder, bowel or bladder incontinence. They may have hematuria. Um, we need to make sure we do a very good uh, assessment. These patients need to get undressed. You need to look at their abdomen, their lower extremities, um, because internal hemorrhage um, in these patients, especially with the pelvic fractures, can be life-threatening. Um, with hip fractures, um, often we'll have a history of a fall. The patient will complain of a sudden onset of bilateral hip pain. About 86% of these uh, the hip fractures occur in persons who are um, older than age 65. Um, often the patient can't bear weight on the affected extremity. I can tell you that I um, have had patients who, one in particular I think about, um, she walked on her hip fracture for about two weeks. Um, it indeed was fractured, but she just was walking on it. Um, when you do your assessment, when you look at this picture, you can see um, that if you looked and we saw the rest of the, the legs, that that right hip probably would look a little bit shorter, okay? Because if you look inside at what's going on, um, you know, the, the affected hip will be shortened and some usually externally rotated if the fracture's displaced. Why is this a big deal? Why do we jump all over these patients and be pretty aggressive? We know that elderly have a one-year mortality rate um, in about 20% 20, 20 of them, and there's a five-year mortality rate in 32% of these patients. So we want to keep them upright. We want to prevent falls. We want to make sure the obviously agent coming in and doing a fall uh, assessment for them. All right. Let's talk about some hip disorders in children. Okay. And the reason I, I made this little graph was for you to be able to, if you have a patient scenario in a question, for you to kind of look at the age and figure out, you know, what would be the most prevalent disorder um, for that age group. So developmental hip dysplasia, we see this in children ages zero to two, okay? The leg calf perps is often in ages four to eight, whereas the slipped capital femoral epiphysis is in older children, your preteen, school age, 10 to 15 years of age, okay? Um, with developmental hip dysplasia, males versus females, you're gonna see um, less males versus females are affected with this. With the leg calves, perps, more males versus the females, and the slipped capital femoral epiphysis is about a little bit equal, a little bit more boys than girls. Um, does it happen bilaterally? Okay. 20% uh, of kids with developmental hip dysplasia will have uh, bilateral symptoms. With leg calf perths, about 10%, so not so common. With slip 
capital femoral epiphysis, it's 25 to upwards to 40% can be have problems bilaterally. So just keep in mind and, and kind of take a look at that um, and, and think about it. So if you have a question that's posed to you and the child is 12 years old and they give you three things to choose from and you have to pick the best um, answer, the most likely diagnosis for that patient would be a skiffy, okay, slipped caporal femoral epiphysis. It wouldn't be developmental hip dysplasia in a 12-year-old, okay? So just a little bit of food for thought when you're thinking about some of these um, childhood hip disorders. All right, hip dysplasia. This is uh, seen in kids, like we said, zero to two years old. Girls more than boys. Um, they may have the Gillesi sign where one femur appears shorter when an infant is supine. And when you have the baby on their belly, on their tummy, um, you're going to see asymmetry of the creases of the legs or the gluteal thigh. Okay. What is the risk for um, a hip dysplasia, breech births? If they're female, um, family history, and oligohydramnosis. How are we going to examine the patients for um, hip dysplasia? Okay. The Ortolani maneuver test. You're going to rotate those hips in a frog leg position, doing abduction and adduction. And if you hear a click or a clunk, or you have palpable trochanter um, displacement, um, that is a positive test, okay? The Barlow maneuvers, you're gonna push both knees together, midline and downward and upward, and you're gonna, once again, is there a click, a clunk, or a palpable uh, trochanter displacement um, by the index or middle finger? Okay, when you're kind of rolling them back and forth. How do we treat hip dysplasia? First thing we're going to do is an ultrasound of the hips. Okay, that's the initial imaging, not an x-ray, an ultrasound. And these patients are going to be referred to the pediatric orthopedist, and often they're going to be in a, um, uh, a harness, or they, they sometimes will, will have the, the cast too, which is the splint. All right, left leg calf Perth disease and slipped capital femoral epiphysis. All right, they're two different disorders. We know with the leg calf Perth disease, okay, these are ages four to eight. Um, you're going to watch until age six, and then they're going to get referred to ortho at six. Um, this is a disorder where the, a lack of blood flow to the femoral head causes osteonecrosis or a vascular necrosis. Um, how are they going to present? This is a, a kid with a limp, okay? They may also complain of pain to the hip, the groin, the thigh, or the knee, and they're going to have limited um, range of motion of that hip joint. Um, we know risks are males more than females, um, Caucasian patients, and we want to make sure that we do address this because these um, kids can end up as adults with arthritis, okay? A skip, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Sometimes you'll see it called skiffy. Skiffy. This is a fracture through the growth plate, um, and it results in a slippage of the overlying end of the femur epiphysis. Okay. This often will happen in an adolescent growth spurt. That's why it's usually seen in ages 10 to 15. This is a kid who presents with a limp. They may have knee or thigh pain. Um, and they may not repeat, uh, they, they won't have a report of trauma, okay? They, they won't have had any type of accident. What are some of the risks? Okay, obesity. We know we've got a real problem with childhood obesity. And so our kids are more at risk for the skiffies because of that. Um, children with endocrine disorders, diabetes, um, growth hormone disorders, um, these kids are going to have a positive Trendelenburg test. Okay, we're going to go through that as well. So for the skiffy, they're going to have a, a positive general test. What is the complication with these kids? They can have um, femoral head necrosis, and um, they can lose um, bone mineral, causing one hip to be lower than the other, so a permanent limb, permanent disability. How are we going to treat them? They're going to be non-weight-bearing or ambulatory. They're going to need to go to ortho. 
Um, often they're going to have to have surgery where they place a metal screw across the growth plate to maintain the position of the femoral head and prevent any um, further slippage. Um, all right, so how do we test that? So the Trendelenburg test, okay. You're going to do this for your leg calf birth disease, your slip capital um, femoral uh, epiphysis. You're going to have the kid stand on the affected side, and this is going to cause a pelvic tilt, okay? You're going to look at the iliac crest. You're going to look at the gluteal folds, okay? And you can see with the Trendelenburg test, it's going to be quite significant that pelvic tilt versus a normal uh, finding, okay? So if it's positive Trendelenburg, at that point, you're going to need to do a hip x-ray. Generally, you're going to do an AP and a frog leg, and you're going to refer these kids to ortho. Okay, benign knee variants. Okay, so they've got some really fancy name, and they've got some slang that goes along with them. So, um, geno recurvatum, this is hyperflexion or backward curvature of the knees. Genu valgum. These are knock knees. Think about valgum. You've got gum sticking your knees together. Um, genu varium. This is bow legs. Um, a way to remember um, varium is that they're on a, um, it's the position you might be in if you were riding a motorcycle. See, the motorcycle says vroom, various. Okay. There's a picture for you to take a look at. Septic arthritis. We use the Copter criteria. You're going to have, this is a, a patient that they will not um, be able to weight bear on the affected side. You're going to run a sed right. It's going to be greater than 40. They're going to have, a fe they're going to be febrile, um, and they're going to probably have a white count um, greater than um, 12,000, okay? Children can have septic arthritis. It's not something you want to miss, okay? So if one out of the four criteria is positive, there's a 3% chance. If two out of four of the criteria are met, there's a 40% chance of septic arthritis. Three out of four of the criteria are positive, there's a 93% chance. And four out of four, um, there's a 99% chance. So this is going to be non-weight bearing with a fever. So you want to make sure you look at those vitals in your kids. They come in with um, non-weight bearing. Okay, good assessment. Vitals are vital. Okay, let's talk about some adult knee issues or adolescents. So I decided that I probably needed to do some visuals to help you understand how the joint of the knee works to help you understand what tests would help you um, diagnose some of the issues. So when we talked about the valgus and the varius, okay, so a varius, okay, the varius, um, pressure your various side is your media your um inner part the valgus is the outer part so you're going to see that see how it's pushing on each side um so the various is the medial the valgus is the lateral okay valgus there's an l there valgus lateral type of pressure the valgus is the, the that side of the the leg so we know that the, the most poorly con constructed joint of the body is the, the knee. Um, the femur's round, tibia is flat. You've got your four bones. You've got the femur, the tibia, the fibula, and the patella. You've got four major ligaments, okay? You've got your MCL and your MCL and your LCL that support um, the knee medially and laterally. And, and support those movements. You've got your ACL and your PCL that support anterior and posterior movement. They're inside of the knee, 
Okay, and then you've got your meniscus, which is a cartilage. So if you wanted to test the LCL or the MCL, you would do a various stress test or a valgus stress test. And we talked about the, you could see the picture here. The various is that you're applying pressure from the inner aspect, the medial aspect of the knee, whereas a valgus stress test, you are applying pressure from the lateral aspect. So various medial, valgus lateral. Um, the the var various test, you're gonna passively bend that knee 30 degrees, you're going to apply various or lateral knee force. Okay. And um, you're going to examine your good extremity first. You want to compare um, both knees. Okay. If you have pain or laxity at 30 degrees, it's an LCL. Um, you know, just an LCL. If you have pain and laxity at zero and 30 degrees, it's an LCL and a cruciate injury, okay? A valgus test, you're gonna bend that knee again to 30 degrees and apply um, valgus pressure, okay? You're gonna repeat the test with um, at zero degrees and in an, or in a neutral position. And you're gonna, do, once again, if, if there's pain and laxity at 30 degrees, it's an MCL. If there's pain and laxity at zero degrees, there's an MCL or cruciate injury, okay? So just keep that in mind. Those um, new tests have been coming in, coming up on the uh, exam over and over again. But when you think about it, if you push um, that various, you're stressing the lateral, if you're pushing the valgus, you're, it's the opposite, it's the medial, okay? So look at that picture, and that may help you remember what you're actually doing when you do these exams. Next thing you're gonna wanna test is your meniscus. We know meniscus is cartilage. McMurray meniscus, M&M, &M, okay? The patient's supine. You're gonna hold the knee and palpate the joint line with one hand. Uh, your thumb's going to be on the side, your finger's on the other, and you're going to hold the sole of the foot and support the limb and move the knee from a position of maximal flexion. You're going to extend the knee with internal rotation of the tibia and a various stress and then return to a maximal flexion and extend the knee with external rotation of the tibia and a valgus stress, okay? Um, if you feel if there's a meniscus a tear or injury, you're going to feel a click, a pop, or pain. Okay, click, pop, or pain when you're doing the McMurray, okay? There's also the athlete compression test, and your patient's prone, so they're, and you place the knee at 90 degrees, and you rotate the leg laterally and medially, and then you apply downward compression and rotate the leg laterally and medially. If the patient has pain with rotation and increased um, Rotation laxity, it's a, a ligament injury. If, once again, there's pain or a pop with rotation and compression with decreased ability to rotate, that's a meniscal injury. So pop, meniscus, McMurray, aptly. Okay, so an ACL and PCL test. So this is like a little X right in the middle of the knee joint. So in order to test that, you're going to use the drawer signs, okay? I'm sorry, the Lachman anterior. So the anterior Lachman and the posterior. So you're going to hold the, the examiner's gonna stabilize the patient's femur with one hand and then pull the tibia anteriorly with the other hand. Okay, that's the anterior lachmans. With the posterior, the examiner is going to push the tibia posteriorly. Okay, your hands are going in opposite directions. Okay, your anterior um, lachman is most sensitive for an ACL rupture. All right, 
with the anterior and posterior drawer. You're also going to be looking at the ACL. Okay, so if you have laxity with anterior force, you're going to have an ACL injury. If you have laxity with posterior force, it's a PCL. Okay, so anterior, posterior, when you're moving your, your hand. So that's what you would use to check the ACL and PCL. There's also a test to test the ACL that's getting some uh, play now in the literature, and it's called the lever test. And your patient's in a supine position. The examiner will stand on the side of the affected knee and place a closed fist be beneath the proximal third of the patient's tibia to hit so the, the tibia is slightly flexed, um, the, the knee is flexed. With the other hand, you're going to apply downward force to the distal third of the femur. The foot should rise from the table. With a ruptured ACL, the foot will not raise. And um, the sensitivity of the lever test is 77 to 100% according to the literature. So you may see some more, and it's a little bit easier to perform in the office. Right. Some of the things um, when your patients come in um, and com are complaining of some knee pain, some of the things in the history may give you a clue what's going on with your patient. So if a patient's going down the stairs and they're having pain um, around or behind the knee, they may have the uh, chondromalacia, because that's in the front, or the iliotibial band syndrome, and that's pain if they report on the side. If they're having pain going upstairs, this is indicative of the patellofemoral um, tendonitis or runner's knee. If you have a patient that um, tells you that they're pain to the front of the knee going up and downstairs, this is often um, your patellar um, tendonitis. If the patient tells you they have um, are feeling pain on the outside or the inside of the knee joint, that is worse when straightened, or they they tell you that it feels like their knee is locking. That often is a cartilage tear or a meniscal injury. Um, if your patient tells you that if your, their knee feels loose or unstable, unstable, um, you do need to um, fully assess them for a ligament tear. If a patient has um, pain after severe um, forceful trauma to the anterior knee. For example, somebody was riding in a car and um, they did a, hit their knee to the dashboard. This, um, you worry about a PCL injury. Often if a patient will um, tell you they, they injured their knee, um, a lot of times with, um, if they're trying to stop a fall or slipping, or your soccer players, your football players, um, sometimes your basketball players, they, they'll be um, trying to stop very quickly from running or twisting, but non-contact. And they tell you that they hear a pop or feel a pop. You, you need to worry about an ACL. Um, you know, we talked about the slipped capital femoral epiphysis and the, the leg calf perth. Um, with the, the skiffy, this is like vague uh, knee pain in an obese child with no trauma. You need to keep in your differential, the skiffy. Um, with the leg calf purse, these, uh, the, the child may complain of groin, hip, groin, or knee pain or stiffness. Keep that in your differential because you don't want to miss a vascular necrosis. Um, Oshkod slaughter disease. Um, this you're going to see in uh, children that are having a growth spurt, often in athletes, runners, soccer players, um, they're going to present with a painful bump below the knee, and that's where the tendon from the kneecap connects to the, the, um, the shin, usually ages 13, 14. Um, another picture, they have the Oscar slaughter. So it's the patel where the patellar tendon connects to the tibial tuberosity. Okay. It's a common cause of knee pain, um, like I said, especially if they've had a recent growth spurt. How do we treat? Usually will resolve spontaneously. Um, you may want to rule out an avulsion fracture and order a lateral um, x-ray of the knee, and you're going to have to 
ask the patient to avoid anything that's aggravating the pain. So they may, you know, um, avoid running the activities that do that, uh, get them going. And that's always a good time trying to get the athletes not to play. All right. So the Ottawa rules. Ottawa rules are, are some rules that we use um, to decide whether or not we want to get an x-ray of a, um, of a joint for the ankle, the foot, or the knee. So for the knee, X-ray is required only if the patient's age is equal to or greater than 55 with the following findings. Isolated patellar tenderness. So if the patient um, has trauma, they went right onto the knee, you want to make sure that you get a sunset view, which actually looks at the patella as if it, it, it looks like a sunset. to Be sure there's no fracture. Tenderness to the head of the fibula. Inability to flex the knee 90 degrees to bear weight. Inability to bear weight both immediately and in the clinic for four steps. Okay, those are definite um, indications to get an x-ray. For the foot, x-ray is only um, indicated if there's pain in the midfoot in any of the following findings. Bone tenderness at the base, base of the fifth metatarsal bone. I know that's that bone that snaps really quickly. Bone tenderness at the navicular bone. And yes, you have a navicular bone in the, the foot as well as the wrist. Inability to weight, bear weight both immediately and in the clinic for four steps. So ankle. Ankle x-ray is required only if there's pain to the malleer zone of any with any of these findings. Bone tenderness along the distal six centimeters or the posterior edge of the tibula or tip of the medial malleolus. Bone tenderness along the distal six centimeters of the posterior edge of the fibula for the tip of the lateral malleolus. And inability again to bear weight both immediately and in the clinic for four steps. So if they can't walk right away and can't do more than four, can't give you four steps in the clinic, they need an x ray for sure. They've got calculators out there. There's a lot of things that you can find on the Ottawa rules. And this is just a picture just so you can kind of see what they're talking about, about the foot, the area um, that would be tender when you do your exam. And there's a lateral of six centimeters, so the medial and laterally, and the base of the fifth metatarsal, and then where your navicular bone is. Ankle springs. Ninety percent of the ankle sprains are um, forced inversion, so just like the the picture in the slide um, to the right. Um, once the individual has a, a significant sprain, they have a significant risk of re-injury. Um, and there are some things that you know when we look at the, the our patients and examine them. There's different grades that we can use, and these are also part of the Ottawa rules. Okay, so a grade one, which is a mild ankle sprain, you're going to rest, um, you're going to use an ace wrap, you may use an air cast or um, an ankle brace for a little bit of support, okay? These people are able to bear weight and ambulate, okay? Grade two is a moderate sprain. This is a partial tearing of the, the ligament. Um, these, when you do your exam, you may see ecchymosis. They may have moderate swelling, pain to palpitation, painful weight, weight bearing, and um, mild to moderate instability. Grade two, you're going to rest, ice, compress, and elevate, but you're also going to get an x ray. These individuals may need to go to ortho, okay? You're probably going to need an air cast or an um, ankle splint, okay? Grade three. Um, that is a, a, they need to go to ortho, but not emergently, okay? A grade three is a complete rupture, okay? And they cannot bear weight at all um, after the injury. They have an inability to ambulate. Um, they have tenderness over the posterior edge of the malleolus. They have severe bruising pain. They'll resist any type of um, foot motion. Um, these individuals, they're going to need uh, an x-ray. 
they may, um, depending on how unstable they are and how uncomfortable they are, they may need to go to the ER, uh, but they also need to go to ortho. And often grade three springs will require a short cast or a cast brace for two to three weeks. So that's the most severe of the three different grades of ankle springs. Okay, and that's popping up on the uh, boards as well. What do you do with an ankle sprain? So if it's a grade one, simple. A strap, maybe use a removable um, air cast or stirrup brace. Grade two, you're gonna wanna send them to ortho. That's the only difference, okay. Grade three, there's going to need a cast. All right. Medial tibial stress syndrome. Okay. These are shin splints. Okay. This is an overuse of the muscles and tendons and bone tissue of the tibia. You're going to see this in runners, your soccer players, um, dancers, individuals who are in the military, um, individuals with... Um, that have flat feet or rigid arches also are at risk for this. And the shin split, most often it incurs in the inside edge of the, the tibia or the, the shin bone. How do we treat? Rest, um, you may do so, use some splints, stretching, massage, NSAIDs. Um, you know, it, if you're worried about a stress fracture, um, you want to do a bone scan versus an x-ray because the um, x-ray won't show that stress fracture. Or you may want to get an MRI. Severe they are. Achilles um, tendon rupture. Okay, the patient's going to tell you they heard or felt a pop when the injury occurs. Um, they may report to you they feel like they got um, kicked in the posterior calf. They have the inability to bend the foot downward or push off the injured leg when walking, so they're going to have a, uh, some trouble with their gait. Um, they cannot st uh, step on their toes. They, if you ask them to stand on their toes, they can't do that. And they, they, these patients can still have plantar flexion. You're going to want to do um, a Simmons slash Thompson test. And so you're going to have your patient lay on their belly, and you're, you're going to have the you're going to squeeze the calf and the foot should plantar flex, okay? A positive Thompson test is when you squeeze that calf, there's no movement of the foot. It's a, um, they, they definitely have a defect in the, the, the Achilles tendon. You wanna palpate. You can see in this picture, you're probably not gonna be able to feel a whole lot, um, or you may feel the defect in the Achilles tendon. Um, treatment, rest, ice, um, compress, elevate. You're going to put these patients on in crutches. You may use a um, walking boot or you may use a splint, posterior splint with the foot flex downward. Um, these people are going to need an ortho referral and they may need surgery to um, correct this. Now, who do we worry about with our um, Achilles tendon rupture? Some of our patients with fluoroquinolones. Okay. Pes planus. This is a fancy word for flat feet. All right. These um, patients have a collapse or flattening of the medial longitudinal arch of the foot. Um, how do we treat them? Proper shoes. You may um, use orthotics, bracing, um, immobilization. You may want to think about PT. NSAIDs, um, weight loss. Uh, you want to encourage weight loss if your patient's obese and they may or may not need surgery. So they may go either to podiatry or ortho. Metatarsis adductus, okay. They um, also call this um, pigeon toe. <clears throat> this is a, a common foot deformity, um, usually noted at birth, that causes the front half of the foot or the forefoot to turn inward. Um, how do we treat the, these little ones? We're going to teach the parents to do some passive stretching to straighten position several times a day. Um, these patients may have serial casting every uh, one to two weeks and or they may have surgery for correction. Subfoot. Um, 
this is also called pet base equinovarus. Okay, that's moving right medially. We know varus means medially. Um, so this is the infant's foot is turned inward. Often the bottom of the foot faces sideways or even upward. This is it's kind of common. It's what happens in about one in every thousand live births. How do we treat? We're going to use a brace. Um, they may use the Ponsetti method where the, the, they um, stretch or, and or cast to gradually um, correct the deformity. They may uh, use casting and or uh, surgery to correct this as well. So here's a picture of the bottom of the foot. So you have a patient, if they come in and they tell you that they have pain to the forefoot um, in between the toes, um, it feels like they're stepping on a stone, you need to think about a plantar neuroma, okay? Pain to that medial aspect at the base of the first great toe, um, you think about a bunion, okay? Your plantar fasciitis, so the midfoot, to the heel, all right? You wanna ask those patients, have they lost weight or gained weight? They're gonna do stretching. They're gonna roll their foot on the, the frozen water bottle. Um, may, they may do orthotics as well. Um, back to the, 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 the back of the foot, if they feel like they're stepping on a stone in the back, um, you know, that may be a stone bruise or a heel spur. So this is just a little picture where you're going to see the pain in the feet if your patient presents um, with some discomfort. And here's another look at the top of the foot where you're going to see um, some of that discomfort. Okay, it's a stress fracture. You're going to see that midfoot. Achilles tendonitis right in the back of the, the foot um, over Achilles tendon. Your plantar fasciitis may not only be on the bottom, it may creep up the, the sides of the back part of the foot. So, so we covered a lot of things today. I hope this helped you when you're looking at some of the orthopedic issues that are going to come into your practice. And I hope it will assist you with your studying for your boards. If you like um, what you see, we've got some more um, videos that are available on the study page, um, and also there are some on um, YouTube as well. We are going to be having a crash course um, for the um, NP boards, and that's going to be Thursday, August 29th at um, 7 to about 10.30, 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Feel free to share um, this video, share our website. We just want to keep growing and helping uh, the students and our colleagues as we uh, take this journey together. And I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, presentation, and we'll see you soon.